Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Nigel, for leading us. Lovely to see you all. Now I can see you. I could hear you. Now I have a chance to look at you, and I even see some people up there in the balcony. Yes. Give me a little wave. Thank you for that. A lot friendlier up there than down here. None of them. Not one of them gave me a wave, but, but you did. Too late now. Too late. But thank you. Lovely song, that one, uh, new one to me, and to you also, Judy. We have the privilege because we travel a lot in, in learning new songs, but great words. This is God's word, objectively to us, but it is also God's personal word to us. And as I teach you this evening, you will obviously hear my voice, but don't be surprised if you feel something of a, a strange nudge within your mind or your heart, because that might be the Spirit saying something, which is just for you. Um, because he is our great teacher, and he has the capacity to be able to say things to us that nobody else knows. We need somebody to say those words, and he will do that. So I share this platform with the Spirit. Now, before I tell you what I'm going to do, um, I will mention some of the resources that I brought with me. On Monday, I, I talked about some of the resources that I've written concerning God, and then last evening, I talked about some of them relating to Jesus, and, and this evening, I want to talk about some of the resources that I've written about the Holy Spirit. I haven't done it in that order because somehow he's the third person of the Trinity and therefore less important than the Father and Jesus, although, to be honest, many of us as Christians think that it's a little bit like that because we think of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He's number three in a list of three, but he is less important than the others. Absolutely not true. Father, Son, and Spirit, each of them are worthy of our worship. Each of them are to be identified as authentic members of the Godhead. But for many Christians, including myself, in my earlier journey with Jesus, the Spirit was somebody who only turned up in my life once in a blue moon. And most of my life, he seemed to live on the other side of the desert and didn't have much to do with me. He was a silent member of the Trinity. And uh, nothing is further from the truth than that. In fact, you may wonder to yourself, maybe you have wondered to yourself, why is he called the Holy Spirit? Which is how he is defined in the New Testament. And uh, you will say to me, well, perhaps it's because he is holy. He's perfect. He's sinless. He doesn't make mistakes. And surely that's what holy means. And it can mean that. But that isn't the fundamental meaning of the word holy. Because in the original Greek in which the New Testament was written, as you know, that word holy is hagios. And hagios means different. He's different. He's separate from. He is different from. Different from what? Different from all the other kinds of spirits and gods and goddesses who were existing in the first century. And when Paul and Matthew and Peter speak about yet another spirit, they need to identify this spirit as being completely different to every other kind of spirit or so-called spirit who existed at the time. And so they preface the spirit with this word hagios. He's different to every other kind of god or goddess or religious force that is apparently out there. And he's different in this respect. You see, all the other gods and all the other goddesses in the first century had something in common. They didn't like people. They were not interested in people. Why would they be? They were apathetic towards where people went. So you didn't pray to the gods with any sense of anticipation that the gods would respond, unless you were the emperor or a famous philosopher or a significant warrior. But most people in the world had no sense of the spirits and the gods and the goddesses being interested in you. And Paul and Peter and Matthew, they introduce another spirit to the Christians that they say, listen, you need to know he's different, different to any other kind of spirit force, so different that we're going to call him the Holy Spirit. How different? Ah, well, he's on your side. In contrast to all the other supernatural deities out there, he's on your side. Not just by your side, but he's on your side to do you good. I wonder how you refer to him. Holy Spirit, Spirit, the very word means breeze or wind in the Greek and the Hebrew. Not a very personal name like Jesus or Lord God, speaking of the Father. Well, I, as uh, Andrew was mentioning a little earlier, think of him as 
friend, my best friend. Not that Jesus isn't my friend and the Father isn't my friend, but the Spirit has been granted to us by Jesus as the best gift that Jesus could give to do us good. And so I've written some books about him. And um, I'm sorry I've drifted, but I will take five minutes off my sermon because of that. But if you're interested in developing your knowledge of the Spirit, not just in terms of your intellectual appreciation of him as a member of the Godhead, but in particular his desire to encounter you and for you to encounter him, then check the books out. There's, there's two there, and um, there's this little one, which is a lot cheaper and a lot easier to read, which encapsulates five major aspects as to who he is in this little book. Check them out. You might find them valu- valuable. And also, may I please encourage you to check out the... the these which you will, <laughs> I was going to say, which you will benefit from in your house groups. That sounds a bit arrogant of me, but we've been told that people have benefited from them. Check them out as well. Well, anyway, now it's my turn to talk about something quite remarkable about Jesus. And if you've been with us for the last few days, you will know that I have a couple of aspirations. I'm looking at some of the miracles of Jesus, and I'm asking the question of the writers, the gospel writers, why did you include these stories in your gospels? Was it to show that Jesus is a miracle worker or a healer? Well, yes, that is true. They've done a good job at proving that. Or is there something more in what they say and why they say it? And in order to find an answer to that, we need to think like a first century Christian who comes to the gospel stories with first century challenges, first century questions, and the worldview of a first century person. These gospels were not written to us in the 21st century. We benefit from them, but they were written to first century people, and the writers do not write as historians or biographers, although everything they say is true, but they write, if you like, as pastors who are wanting to speak to the needs of the people to whom they are writing. And one of the major things they want to do is to say special things about Jesus, who is fundamentally impressive, but he is much more impressive than those first century readers might have realized. And so they tell the stories of Jesus in the hope that people will realize afresh, if not for the first time, that he is quite remarkable. And that's what we're going to be doing again this evening by looking at one story. I better read it. Now, this is a story that's told in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And if you come tomorrow evening and you think, oh, dearie me, he's reading the same reading that he read last night. Somebody needs to tell him that he's already preached this. Relax. Because this story includes two stories. But I'm going to read it to you. I think we're going to get it up on screen. It's from Matthew chapter 9. If you have texts with me, it's, um, it's a story that actually told is, in, is actually told in Matthew and Mark and Luke. You may remember that one of the stories we explored on Monday, or the story we explored on Monday, is only recorded in Mark. It was particularly relevant for his audience, who needed to know that Jesus had time for them. Last evening, we looked at a story that's only in the Gospel of Matthew, because it was very important for his young Christians to realize their status as followers of Jesus and the potential that they had. This evening, we're going to look at a story that is so important to the three gospel writers, other than John, that they each include the story. Here we go. While he, Jesus, was saying these things to them, it happens to be the disciples of John the Baptist, he was teaching them, behold, a ruler came in and he knelt before him, Jesus, saying, my daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her and she will live. And Jesus rose and followed him with his disciples. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. She said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, Your faith has made you well, and instantly the woman was made well. And then Jesus came to the ruler's house, and he saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion. He said, go away. The girl is not dead. She's sleeping. And they laughed at him. 
But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl arose. Those stories have been put together by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they have little ways of making sure that we don't lose sight of the fact that they are together. The number 12 is common. The little girl is 12 years old. The lady has had a 12-year hemorrhage. The stories relate to two most unfortunate women. Both of them find themselves in states of ceremonial uncleanness. And Jesus ministers to their needs and their lives are transformed. So there are similarities, but that's where the similarities end. Because as we will see tomorrow, Jesus responds to the needs addressed to him of a most significant ruler of a synagogue in that community. A man who has prestige and power. An important man, rich man. And he asks Jesus for help. First, but before Jesus helps his need, Jesus responds to somebody else. And who is this somebody else? Well, she is unnamed, she is most marginalized, and she is, by contrast to the ruler, poverty stricken. And she receives the touch of Jesus first. Already I am wanting to ask questions of the writers of these stories, and I hope that when you read these Gospels, you will slow yourself down from reading to the end of the story to move to the next one and ask some questions of the writers. You will not hear them speaking back to you, but you will give yourself the opportunity to pause and consider why have these literary craftsmen written in the way that they have written, why have they done it? Because they are not just writing history, they are wanting to present the opportunity for us to dialogue with the text, as, you were, as, as it were. So why, Jesus, did you touch this lady before you touched this prestigious man? Well, let's have a little think about her. And all we're going to do this evening is explore the story about how Jesus touches this most unfortunate woman. And tomorrow, we'll look at the ruler and his 12-year-old little girl. Who was the woman that Jesus responds to first, who comes to him second? Well, she was desperate. And she was desperate for a number of reasons. She has been bleeding continuously for 12 years. And as a result of that, we hear from one of the other Gospels, she has no money left. She has spent all her money trying to find a cure from a doctor or some other therapist, and it has been without success. She's desperate. But also, the bleeding from her vagina puts her in a very difficult situation in the Jewish community. You see, according to the law of Leviticus, her constant hemorrhaging of blood means that she is unclean, ceremonially unclean, as far as the rules of Judaism are concerned. And it's even worse than that, because as a result of her hemorrhaging, she cannot get close to people. She would not be allowed to come into this gathering this evening because the assumption by the Jews of the time is that her ceremonial contamination can be discharged onto others. She doesn't have to touch us for that to happen. If she's in our proximity, then the rules are she will contaminate us. So her life is abjectly lonely. And it's worse than that because, you see, she can't get a husband because that would make him ceremonially unclean. She will never be married in this situation. And that puts her even more in that Jewish setting into a most unfortunate situation because if she can't have a husband, then that means no children. That means no grandchildren. She's on her own. She's helpless and she's hopeless. But it's worse than that. Because in the first century, in the ancient Near Eastern world, and particularly amongst the Jewish people, the assumption is, as I mentioned last evening, I think, if you are ill, the assumption is you must have sinned. It's not true, but that's what they believed, and the religious people tended to emphasize that truth. So the assumption is on the part of this lady, I must have done something wrong that is so severe 
that God has chastised me, has punished me with this 12-year-long complaint. And however many times she may have repented from whatever it was that she perceives she must have done, she clearly hasn't repented sufficiently because the hemorrhage is still continuing. Not only have people abandoned her, but it looks as if God has abandoned her as well. No one brings this woman to Jesus. In the story that co-joins this one, the father comes to Jesus on behalf of his daughter. But this lady, she's on her own. No father comes to bring her to Jesus. She's seriously ill. She's seriously helpless. And what can she hope to gain from Jesus? You see, it's one thing for an impressive religious ruler of a synagogue, a man. It's one thing for him to approach Jesus, but what has she got to offer? She shouldn't even be there. It's a miracle that she needs, but that's a forlorn hope. She can't even announce her presence because she will be condemned by others and presumably, most significantly, by Jesus for being there. She's run out of hope. But there is a glimmer of hope that she has within her because she believes that Jesus can meet her need. And he does. He allows his mission to a dignified ruler's home to be interrupted by this marginalized, unnamed, desperate woman and to be interrupted by her touch. And Jesus focuses first on this forlorn and friendless woman. She lives on the margins of her community, and Jesus frees her from her disability and makes it possible for her to be re-included into her community in a way that she has never experienced for the previous 12 years and before the resplendent ruler is helped by Jesus. So what am I learning about Jesus so far? Because we have not yet moved to the transformation that Jesus will provide. What have I learned about him? Well, I think that what I've learned is that Jesus is keen to provide hope to those who are burdened, to those who are in need. But here's the extra truth. He is keen to be involved in the lives of those who feel desperately unimportant. They have nothing to offer. And this woman certainly is in that category. And she will not be offended if Jesus rejects her. But the beauty of this story is that Jesus does more than not reject her. He does more than heal her. But I'm getting ahead of myself and I'll, I'll talk to you about just how exalted Jesus makes this woman feel in the presence of others. But let's come back to the lady before I, I talk about Jesus. What does, um, what, does the, what does this lady do in the presence of Jesus? You'll remember in the story that we read that the ruler politely asks Jesus for his help. And he politely asks Jesus if Jesus will come to his house. Well, this woman doesn't politely ask Jesus for help at all. In fact, she doesn't ask for help. In fact, I think she probably doesn't have the confidence to ask Jesus for help because why would he respond in a friendly way when she knows that she shouldn't be there in the first place because the rules of the community as laid down in the book of Leviticus is that she should not be there because her condition results in her contaminating everybody else. In fact, we are told that she is fearful. We are told that she trembled. The only time in the Gospels that anybody trembles in the presence of Jesus. She trembles. She's scared. She hasn't thought of the words to ask Jesus for help because um, she's too terrified. She's petrified. Oh, she knows that Jesus has healed other people in the past, but she's different. She has proven her guilt by having this sickness for 12 years. And she is assuming, I suspect, that It will not be appropriate for her to try and get the attention of Jesus to her need. But at the same time, she knows that he could heal her. 
If only she could get his attention. But that's a wild dream for the reasons that I've mentioned thus far. And so, if she can get his attention, she decides to touch him. And Matthew says something very interesting, and it, it often pays us to slow down we read these, when we read these stories, because Matthew tells us that this lady believed that a single touch, a single touch, will be enough for her to receive from Jesus that which she needs. She believes if I touch him just once, and not just him, but if I touch his garment, and not just his garment, but the, the hem of his garment, the fringe of his garment. This is a woman who lives in the margins of her society, and if she just touches the margins of Jesus' gown, that's as much as she thinks she can do. She doesn't grasp it. She doesn't hold on tightly to it. She doesn't cut a piece from it. She just touches the lowest part of his garment, the piece of the garment that drifts through the dust. All she deserves. That's what she might have thought. <laughs> Not only that, but you notice how she does it? You know the story and we read it, so I'm only reminding you that which you know. She came from behind to touch Jesus. So she sees Jesus coming towards her, but she backs off because she knows she shouldn't be there. So she walks around and comes from behind Jesus and touches him. She is ritually contaminating everybody in the crowd. She shouldn't be there. She is a walking embarrassment, walking wounded. What right did she have to receive anything from Jesus when she is breaking God's law in being there in the first place? And she touches Jesus in a way that won't disturb him. It won't embarrass him. He won't even know that she's doing it. He won't even know that she's there. She doesn't want to interrupt his journey to the most important ruler's life. She doesn't, she doesn't want to trouble Jesus. She doesn't want to be a nuisance. And I wonder whether from time to time, even this evening, you may be feeling, that's, that's me. I would love a touch from Jesus. I would love his involvement in my life, but I'm just afraid I'm a bit of a nuisance. Maybe because I've been and asked before, or maybe because I've never asked before, but why should he respond to me? Because I am nothing special to him. He, as we were singing in the songs, happens to have created the universe. Why would he deign to do anything for me, let alone think about me? Well, let's see what Jesus does for this lady. And that will give you encouragement to realize that not only is he interested in us receiving from him, but he is even more interested in giving to us that which he perceives is for our best. So let's now address Jesus. What does Jesus do in response to this somewhat unusual way of receiving healing? Well, Jesus says, who touched me? Who touched me? You've got to wonder why Jesus asked that question. In fact, the disciples wondered why Jesus asked that question. And in effect, they answered their own question by saying, Jesus, for goodness sake, there's crowds of people here. Some of them can't help but touch you because they want to get close to you. Some of them can't help but touch you because other people are pushing them to you. Some of them are deliberately trying to touch you. What do you mean, who touched you? Everybody's touching you, Jesus. Uh, but Jesus has a plan in asking the question not a trivial question. It is a carefully crafted question. Who touched me? Because he wants the lady to admit that it was her. Why might he want her to admit that it was her? Well, presumably, it is so that he can say, who do you think you are? What are you doing here? You know you shouldn't be here. You're breaking the law. You've contaminated all these people. We now have to go through a process of seven days ceremonial cleansing before we can come back into society. You have contaminated me. Who do you think you are? That's what Jesus could have said to her. Or he could have said, what do you think you're doing touching my garment? I'm not some magician. This is not some quasi-magic act. If you want me to do something for you, then just ask me. Like the ruler did. There's your template. Not do this strange way of receiving healing from me. Trying to steal your healing? 
Well, that's not why Jesus asks the question. He's not wanting to reprimand her. He's not going to embarrass her. He's not going to humiliate her. He's not going to say that she has taken her healing inappropriately. Quite the contrary, as we will see. And eventually, her mind wavering and her heart pounding, I suspect, she acknowledges that it was she who touched him. So now what does Jesus do? Well, the first thing he does, and it's not to heal her, the first thing that he does is to call her daughter. Matthew records that for us. Daughter. She who cannot have a daughter. She who has not been brought as a daughter by her father. Like the ruler, Jesus calls her daughter. And she's the only lady in the Gospels that Jesus refers to as daughter. What an unworthy candidate she is for Jesus to call her daughter. She's the only one. And specifically, Matthew wants me us to notice that. Before Jesus does anything for her physically, he makes a statement about his perception of her. In the status of Judaism, she is hopeless, helpless, marginalized. But for Jesus, his daughter. And then secondly, she's scared. She was reticent to ask for his help. And so she touches him. Now, to you and me, we might accuse her of doing something that is based on superstition. That's rather magical. What do you think? He's got some magical power that's participating in his garment. Is that what you're doing? For goodness sake, that's not the correct way to receive anything from Jesus. But for Jesus, her action indicates her faith. What she does that we might quibble with and want to suggest that she does it differently, Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't correct her action. He doesn't say you should have done it this way. He doesn't encourage her to have faith. He certainly doesn't encourage her to have more faith. On the contrary, her action of touching his garment and her belief that a single touch will do, that receives the highest approval from Jesus. And he says to her, in effect, and to anybody listening, Anybody looking, and to those of us who read the story, he says to her, or to us, do you see what she's doing? She believes in me. She believes in me. And the manifestation, the outworking of her belief in me, her trust in me, her assessment that I can do something, is that if she touches me, then she knows I'll do it, or she knows I can do it. And for Jesus, he puts this lonely woman in the limelight, and gives this shocked woman the chance to shine. She becomes the star of the show. Jesus, when he said, who touched me? (laughs) Well, she must have felt her heart stop with anxiety. She hasn't had time to get away to check whether the bleeding has stopped. It's too late. She's been found out. And life suddenly gets a lot worse when Jesus says, who touched me? And she has no excuses. But here's the point. Jesus is in complete charge of the process. And he has placed her center stage for a purpose. The crowd stops because Jesus stops. The focus moves from Jesus to this ordinary, marginalized, unimportant, sinful woman. As far as she is concerned and as far as the crowd is concerned. And the point is that Jesus has come to include the excluded, and he's come to include the excluded who doesn't feel that she has a reason to be re-included, because she assumes that her situation is because she sinned, and God has marked her as a sinner. Well, the crowd fills the space around Jesus, but it's for a moment, it's as if for a moment the world stands still while Jesus focuses on her and says to you and me, you see her? You see what she's done? Do not diminish her in your thinking. Do not patronize her by what she has done. She believes in me. And Jesus has the capacity to appreciate what she has done and as a result of it, to elevate her as someone who believes in him. 
We don't have any recorded words of this lady, but we do have some recorded words of Jesus. And other than him saying, who touched me, the next two things that he says is this. He says, take heart, go in peace. Take heart, go in peace. In other words, Jesus is not just introducing himself to her as her healer. In fact, the healing is hardly touched on. Although clearly she does get healed, but now he wants to introduce himself to her as somebody who cares for her, who is somebody who, when he says daughter, is not just offering some cliched piece of jargon, but this is a reality from his perspective as to his perception as to who she has the potential of being, daughter, relationship, friendship. He is introducing himself to this lady, not just as healer, but as savior in a much more comprehensive way. So what am I learning from Jesus, or about Jesus from this story? Jesus has time for people who are in need. Jesus has time for people who are just nervous that they're not that important to him, as a result of which they are reticent to ask. This story must remind us that he views us with a different perspective to the way that we view ourselves. But there's one more thing that I need to mention, and um, Luke is the one who identifies this little piece of information, and it's this, because Luke tells us that when this lady was healed of her hemorrhage, power left Jesus. Do you remember that? Power left Jesus, and he sensed it go. Now, Luke, what are you trying to tell me there? Are you trying to tell me that somehow Jesus lost some of his power and that somehow it needed to be replenished? Are you saying that every time he healed, he was denuded a little bit of his power? So if he healed a lot of people by the end of the day, then he was completely exhausted or wiped out or spiritually exhausted. Is that what you're trying to tell me? That seems highly unlikely. Jesus is God. Jesus doesn't run out of his resources. It's impossible for him to run out of his resources. He is comprehensively God, always was, always will be. He cannot run out of any of his divine resources. So Luke is not telling us that somehow Jesus lost something and had to somehow have it spiritually replenished. No, no, the point is this. I suggest to you that when that lady received the touch of Jesus, not only did she benefit from it, but Jesus felt that power leave him. In other words, something of him left him to go to her. In other words, the healing wasn't something that was achieved objectively by some distant God who just sent the message and the healing took place, the transformation took place. And Jesus could have done it that way. But on the contrary, the message that Luke wants me to hear is that when Jesus makes a difference in our lives, it makes a difference to him as well. What is that trying to tell me? Because I happen to know, as you do, that, that Jesus was part of the creation of the universe. How on earth can... It be that when he touches us, it makes a difference to him. He's God, and we are just human people. But the message is, ah, but God, in his desire to relate to us, he wants that encounter to make a difference to him as well as to us. He doesn't just walk with us. He doesn't just look at us from a distance. He doesn't just walk with us from a distance. He doesn't just watch us from another world taking care of us. But he touches us in ways that mean that he and we feel the difference. Now, I feel that that is almost sacred territory. You see, I'm very happy for Jesus to touch me once in a blue moon. If he did it once in a billion years, I would feel that I have received more than I deserve. And you might feel the same. But the message of Jesus is, I could have saved you without coming, but I have come for 33 years to reveal to you something of the heart of who God is. And Jesus and the Spirit and the Father are all God. And the message that we have is that Jesus desires to meet with people intimately and personally and individually, which means that he meets with us differently to other people because we are all different from one another. How can he do that? Well, it's not so important how he does it. What's more important that he wants to do it. He could blanket us with a blessing, but he says, oh, no, 
You're much more important than that. And we resist that statement and we say, no, we're not Jesus. We're not that important. But his message is to us, okay, let me tell you some stories about how I met people in the first century so that you begin to convince yourself that it is true, that I think of you as very special and I will minister to you very personally and I will call you daughter and I will call you son. And you will be nervous of receiving those accolades because you don't think you're worthy of them. Well, remember that lady. She definitely didn't deserve that. But Jesus still called her daughter. Well, I need to pray. And I want to thank the Lord on behalf of us all for this unbelievable grace that he has for us. He has not just saved us. Not just adopted us, and Nigel mentioned that in his prayer, which is a wonderful truth. But he has decided to create eternity with us in mind. And you have not been destined for this life. You have been destined for eternity. You have been created for eternity, programmed for eternity. And it's in eternity that we will enter into that which God has planned for us from the beginning of time. A relationship with him that is unbelievable in terms of proximity with us. But... He says, I'd like you to start that fellowship here, that relationship, that togetherness. So we must get over our sense of unworthiness and inadequacy and sinfulness. And we're all of that and see how God perceives us. Daughters, sons, in whom he wants to make a difference. And when he does, it makes a difference to him as well. So let me pray. Father, some of these truths are so remarkable <clears throat> that if Jesus hadn't lived them out, I would not, or at least I would struggle to believe them. Because I am so aware of my failures, not just my failures, but my sins. And um, I would rule myself out of receiving much attention from you if it was left to me. And so thank you. Not just because of your inexplicable grace and uh, unfathomable love. But thank you for your desire to ensure that we encounter you and experience your love, be it emotionally or intellectually, within our beings. And thank you that you choose to encounter us as individuals. And so my prayer is that you will help us to be open to the possibility of being surprised by those moments of inspiration whereby you will say something to us, make us feel something which will be a manifestation of your desire to be closer to us than we would dream or imagine. Thank you for this beautiful story. Amen. Amen. I think we're going to sing a song.